The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television. For the 11th time in franchise history, the St. Louis Cardinals are World Series champions. They wrapped up their second title in six seasons with a 6-2 win Friday night over at the Texas Rangers. St. Louis area native David Freeze tied the game at two in the first with a two-run double and was named the series MVP after winning the same honor in the NLCS. I'm trying to soak this all in. I've tried to soak in this whole postseason. Uh, as much as I can, because you never know if it's if it's your last uh, attempt at a title. Um, you know, it's going to take me a little bit, I think, to to realize what what we've accomplished. As young as Freeze is, 67-year-old Cards manager Tony Larusa is a big league veteran. There isn't anybody on this team, the other team too, that uh, when you're a young kid, you don't think about winning World Series, and it's also always in Game Seven. So, truly, a dream come true. It was an exciting season for the Cardinals and their fans, as they were ten and a half games back in the wild card race on August 24th. They caught the Braves and eventually beat the Phillies and Brewers in the playoffs. Game seven winning pitcher Chris Carpenter was pulled in the seventh, having allowed six hits and two runs. I just continued to go out and try to make pitches, and I felt like as the game went on, I felt stronger. Um, my stuff got better, my command got better, and. Uh, uh, I was able to make some some really good pitches when I had to, and, and I mean these guys, again, never gave up. The losing pitcher was starter Matt Harrison, who went just four innings. Cards closer Jason Mott came in for the final three outs in the ninth inning. For Ranger skipper Ron Washington, it was a series of lost opportunities. You know, sometimes when opportunity is uh, in your presence, uh, you certainly can't let it get away because. Sometimes it takes a while before it comes back. Um, you know, if there's one thing that happened uh, in this World Series that I'll look back on is uh, being so close, just having one pitch to be made and one out to be gotten, and it could have been a different story. For St. Louis fans, the excitement could be short-lived, as first baseman Albert Pujols is a potential free agent. He was a key member of the 2006 championship team and says the world title is the ultimate prize. This is what you play for. Uh, I think uh, it doesn't matter the numbers. It doesn't matter the records. Uh, it doesn't matter the money that you make. It's uh, what it matters is uh, to raise that trophy and to be able to... Uh, bring that smile to the city of San Luis, and, and not just the city of San Luis, but uh, all our fans, you know, around the world. Hello and welcome to a very special episode number 15 of As We See It. This is Holly Hurley about St. Louis. As you can hear in that clip, we were celebrating the cards winning the World Series. Uh, it's big times here in St. Louis. And uh, guys, I think it's official. Everywhere that I move wins a national championship. And by guys, I mean Ed joining us there from Boston, BaseNet. And uh, also from BaseNet, Larry, my beloved lobster, joining us from Brookline. And way out in Pennsylvania, we'd also like to welcome Fred. Hi, boys. Hey, Holly. Hi, Holly. So what do you think about it? Cards win the World Series. I'm so sorry Yay. to have stolen the trophy from you, but you know where I go, the trophies follow. But that's pretty cool. That's that's awesome. That's definitely something that uh, a trend that we've started. We started it two years ago, actually two years ago with the Celtics and then the Bruins and then last year with the uh, Giants out in San Francisco and now St. Louis Cardinals. And everywhere that base net is or is starting coverage in the city, we seem to win championships. That's pretty cool. And so congratulations to the Cardinals. It's a little strange for me to say that because up until 10, 15 years ago, when Major League Baseball redesigned their divisions and they came up with the Central Division, the Cardinals were the arch rivals of the New York Mets when they were both in the Eastern Division of the National League. So I've always had like this lifelong hatred of the Cardinals as I did of the Red Sox and here I am now the Red Sox are my adopted team and the Cardinals won the World Series and since we have our show about St. Louis I'm actually thrilled so this is pretty cool yeah I think yeah, it's a great know. thing for the Cardinals they won the World Series I don't know if they won it before second, like you said you 11 know. this is their 11th world championship and it's their Beautiful. second in the past five years 
I think, I think that's I think that's great. I mean, you know, being a Mets fan, my Mets didn't make it in, and like you said, when they changed divisions, it made it safe now, and now we just have to hate Atlanta. But um, you know, I think it's a great idea, and I'm glad we have people down there that can cover it live. So I think it's great. And I I want to just thank um, the Associated Press is uh, where we got our little World Series clip from. Well, you know, it was such an exciting weekend for me. I was with uh, a number of MBA students from St. Louis, and we all uh, were sequestered for this great sustainability conference that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. And we were in Portland, and we were in a bar called Spirit of 77, which is like a really famous uh, sports bar there in Portland. And it was just filled to the brim with Cardinals fans. And are, and are, we, so talking, are we talking Portland, Oregon, or Maine? Uh, Portland, Oregon. Okay. So uh, yeah, Portland, Oregon. So uh, so we you know it's filled to the brim with uh, with Cardinals fans. And as you know, as that very last inning ended, everyone in the bar started chanting S T L, S T L, S T L. I don't I mean, get it. What's that spell? <laughs> I'm only, only, only kidding. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, we had a. It was a, an amazing experience to have with so many people. Uh, you know, just loving St. Louis from St. Louis, just taking it with us where we go. It was great. Pretty cool. Well, once again, congratulations, St. Louis Cardinals, and uh, let's go Mets in 2012. Anyway, That's the hope. That's uh, what the hope. do we have coming up next here, guys? Or what's the first on our... We say that last year and the year before that. I've been saying that every year since 1986, as far as I know. All I want to know is how we're going to screw it up this year anyway. But that's okay. Number one on your agenda there, Fred. Number one on my agenda is a, an article that I read in the New York Post yesterday. Uh, it's called Above the Law. It's about a bunch of, about, about, matter of fact, 21 New York City police officers being indicted for ticket fixing. And the unions, the unions up in arms. These guys are actually being charged. They say there are signs up being said that it's been going on since the days of the Egyptians, and it's a courtesy, not a crime. And ticket, but, fix, and ticket fixing in what respect? As in, like the quota system, the non-existent quota system? Or? Well, no, no, no. It, 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 it's not that. What's happening is that a, uh, a basically they're fixing tickets that have been issued by police officers to other police officers, their friends. And they're making sure that they're secured. And uh, the prosecutors are talking about that they uh, filed nearly 1,600 criminal charges stemming from nearly 300 ticket-fixing cases. The indictments accused cops of uh, a barrage of felonies, including forgery, conspiracy, tampering with public funds, a Do public record, official misconduct. So they're, they're doing anything to get their friends or other cops off the hook from these things. Uh, exactly. And they said the cops cost the city of New York between $1 and $2 million, that's a million with an M, in potential revenue from unpaid, from the, uh, from the what would have been paid tickets. That... Uh, and it's been accept apparently it's been accepted all over for decades, which we all know it does happen. But this is going rampant, and it is even though it happens, it's not right. It's still a crime. That's a lot and of money in a. Uh, it's a lot of money in a town or a state that's uh, you know in pretty bad shape. Yeah, this whole thing started when the first cop arraigned yesterday, uh, well, Friday, actually, this is yesterday's paper, was a 19-year veteran named Jose Ramos, who uh, sparked the entire pro, apparently, because of his refuted ties to Bronx drug leader Lee King. Uh, the investigation was winding down when he was caught up in a wiretap talking about fixing a ticket, sparking the bigger probe. Uh, they talk about a lot of things in here, but the thing is that that, Please let's let's understand it. This is not the not typical of all police departments or all police officers. It's simply a group of people that got caught doing something illegal that they thought they were above the law. Mm -hmm. So, and I how, don't want to clarify this, that. This was how many? Twenty-one so far. They, so Twenty-one so far have been invited. Uh, have been indicted after a uh, DA probe, and the union. What what gets me is that the unions, um. The union is having a is having a uh, they 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 going nuts with this. That they, that despite damaging evidence mounted against the cops, the presiding officers outside, led by the union officials, lashed out at the NYPD for stating for starting the probe, and blasted Police Commissioner Ray Kelly and Bloomberg as hypocrites. So what's the union trying to say that this has been going on forever? So it's okay. Yeah, they're saying so it's okay since it's been going on forever. It's okay. And yeah, well, it's not you know, okay. just uh, I, I seem to remember Nixon saying that, or at least other politicians in the era of Nixon saying, well, okay, you know, what Nixon did, everybody did. He just happened to have gotten caught. Well, well and I, I actually think that uh, this 
becomes in a I've heard about a lot of this sort of stuff throughout the ages and if you think on it you actually probably have too seen it reported about multiple times it does happen on a large scale and what happens actually you know they did a report on NPR uh, many months ago about how the way it seems to happen is that there's so much of it and it's so rampant within these programs I mean 21 people is a lot of people you know that it's so rampant it's actually basically you either work with them or they'll either get you killed or get you kicked off the force I mean, oh, yeah. the peer pressure on these kind of small, I mean, it seems like small things, but but they add up to be big misuses of the public trust, you know? There's also something else. This involves civilians as well. I mean, there are, and these aren't just uh, uh, beat cops, all right? You've got lieutenants involved in this. One lieutenant who was uh, a cop for 16 years, up for the, one of the first female captaincies we got caught. We got a mm. cop, uh, this guy, Wanda Ramos, uh, uh, Juan, uh, Jose Ramos, that I mentioned before, has his girlfriend involved in this. You know, they, they scratched up her car. They were doing insurance fraud. They got $1,000 for keying up her car from Geico. So this has been going on for years, and they got caught. Mm. These people are just dishonest. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's it's a little frightening, but I think I almost find this story a little bit comforting because once these things are taken care of, then the cops can go on with doing a good job. You almost have to route this stuff out every few years just so that those people who really just want to go in and do a good job will have a place to do that. There's obviously always a bad apple in every basket. So, you know, here there happen to be 21 of them, at least that we know of so far. But, yeah, but that's a lar- it's also a large basket. Sure, sure, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, large... it's not, it's not like, a lot like Pocono Township where I live where you made 35 officers on the force, 21 being bad is different than 21 cops being bad in New York City. No, we're talking Angeles. the largest police department in the in the country, New York. Yeah. Yeah. Yes and no, but anyway, you look at it, 21 is a lot of people. Lot. Think, oh, yeah, I know that, I know that. Well, but I think the argument that NPR was making is it is unfortunate, but these kinds of situations breed this kind of behavior. And it, it, it's very unfortunate for the cops who really want to just do a good job because there is a lot of peer pressure because they're so on the line in order to be able to catch these people, in order to be able to do these things. A lot of this stuff is going gonna, is gonna to happen. It breeds this level of, sm- I, I don't know if you want to call it misdemeanor, but like this level of sort of, it's a slippery slope. You know, you do one thing yeah. to get the right catch, and then it becomes the norm, and then it becomes your life. Yep. And while, while we're talking about cops that are above the law, uh, I want to bring in Larry the Lobster now. Larry, uh, this is, would be a good time to bring up that little story you mentioned to me about the uh, the cop that got busted for speeding. If you want to bring everybody oh, up to date on that. That's and good. maybe we could kick this story oh. around a little. Okay, it's a police officer from the Miami Beach Police Department who was running late and getting to a second job and he was clocked at 120 miles an hour on the Florida Turnpike and there was a Florida Highway Patrol officer behind him with the blue lights on signaling for him to pull over and instead of pulling over he floored it and kept going and they finally caught up with him and arrested him and Good. No, but there's more to it and <laughs> after Right. And after he was arrested, you would figure that the, okay, you know, like the the chief or, you know, whoever is in charge of the Miami Beach Police Department would throw the book at know, him, throw the book at him and, you know, say, you're suspended for a month while we conduct an investigation. Instead, that police officer is back on active duty. And that's wrong. Here, here. In that case, I absolutely agree with that. My initial uh, thought on it was um, I, I didn't think so, but I, unfortunately, I didn't know the whole story. In hearing the whole story, if this is indeed how it went down, obviously, um, this particular cop's, uh, you know, your stereotypical menace to himself and society, the way he was driving, he certainly doesn't belong uh, on the police department, at least until... This is, you know, until he gets his. Just want to make sure I understand what Larry's saying. This guy's back on duty now. Back on duty, full yep. duty. No, no, rep, no reprimand, no nothing. And full duty, not pushing a pencil behind a desk either. Full oh, duty. Oh, that's not good. Well, Why I mean, some, I, and, and what town is this out of? Miami, was it, Larry? Miami send your, Beach. Let's send, let's send your cards and letters to the Miami Police Department. Yeah. Oh, I just, and, I think that's, I think it's really interesting, just because of how fast he was going, and then it's like, you know, you're a cop. 
you know you're going to get caught, you know? Like, and, d don't don't try to get Well, right. and, you know, this is how, in my opinion, this, the way I see it, this ties into Fred's New York story. This cop figures he's above the law, and he's going to get away with it. And you know what? Damn it, he did. It, <laughs> so far, it, anyway. It, oh, you know? and, and one more thing. And as he was on his way to a second job, he was... I wonder if he got fired from his second job, because he was late after all. No, but while he was flying, but while he was flying along at 120 miles an hour, trying to get to a second job on time, he was in a police car from the Miami Beach Police Department. Oh, oh man, this story gets better and better. So yeah. let's see. So let's say he's using a police car to go to a second job. Mm -hmm, to moonlight, right? It's moonlight, because a lot of departments, a lot of a lot of police officers take their cars home with them, but it's supposed to go from from the from home to the department back to home. Right. Not to so your so second. Now we have misappropriation of city property. Mm -hmm. Like I said, ladies and gentlemen, your cards and letters sent to the Miami Police Department. Tell them how outraged you are. And Larry, please follow up on this story. You know, uh, follow it online and get back to us next week or six months from now whenever we uh, hear more on this story. And I think we'd all be curious as to uh, see what the outcome is. What's next on our agenda? Well, uh, I, I went to a really interesting conference this weekend, which is hence why my throat is so incredibly sore. I thought I, uh, that was from uh, cheering for the Cardinals. Well, in my, that's a big part of it, in all <laughs> truth. There, I was cheering for a lot of things this weekend. Um, those of you who are avid BaseNet fans know that uh, many moons ago I did an interview with the Harvard Director of Sustainability. Which you, uh, could, still see, which you could still see on um, either the BaseNet archives at basenet.co or on our YouTube page at uh, youtube.com slash basenet network. Absolutely. And that conversation, I think, was a big part of uh, me coming to business school and the kind of career that I wanted to have. And, and that career, been... Holly, I think I stepped on you. That was at Harvard? Yes, I had it. It was an interview with the Associate Director of Sustainability at Harvard. Okay. Or is that Havid? Havid. Yeah, Havid, Havid, Holly yeah. Pacta Khan, Havid. Yes, exactly. So, uh, so anyway... This weekend, I went to a business conference called Net Impact, which is all companies that are trying to do something socially responsible, that are driving towards a greener future, if you will, a more sustainable future. You know, you'd be surprised that some of the companies were there, companies that notoriously over the years perhaps have not been very green companies like your Walmarts or your Nikes, who have in the past 10 or so years made huge changes to become more sustainable. And then companies like REI and Keen, which in their very core values are very, very sustainable and have really worked towards being as low impact on the environment as possible, while being very high impact, if you will, in the bottom line. And these companies are working on a, uh, a very popular theory called the triple bottom line, which is, you know, you have your, your double bot, you have like your first bottom line, you know, at the top with your revenue, you have your second bottom line with your actual profits. And then that third bottom line, these companies believe is, you know, being socially responsible, doing something good for the world at large. Uh, what do you guys think about, uh, about companies? Companies taking on this kind of responsibility. I very good. Yep, and I think just as far as sustainability in any way, shape, or form, what comes to a layman's mind right off the bat is just the whole issue of going green, which that Harvard uh, interview you did on BaseNet for After Dark a couple years ago was tied into an entire episode that we did on people going green. You went into different local hardware stores to investigate the different items that they had, uh, such as the compact for us and bulbs and so on and so forth. And to this day, when I go into a business particularly, because businesses tend to be multi-million or billion dollar businesses, I'll look around and see how green they're going. Um, you know, I'll go into a Starbucks or a Panera Bread or different coffee shops and whatnot, and I'll notice... Some still have incandescent bulbs, believe it or not, and then others now have gone to LED bulbs, if not the compact fluorescents. And um, that's the first thing that comes to mind for me in sustainability is just what everybody's doing to go green. 
Yeah, you know, it, well, it's, it's interesting because those, you know, this is something that we talked about with uh, with, uh, with the Harvard Associate Director. You know, Nathan, uh, his name's Nathan Gauthier, by the way, that's G-A-U-T-H-I-E-R. Uh, one of the things he said is the things that we see on the level of, as you said, going into our hardware store or our Walgreens are actually a very, very small part of what's going on. You know, these businesses are overhauling the way that they do their operational processes, the way that they source materials for the items that we wear. And then, you know, down the chain, uh, this, the way that they choose the retail outlets. And, you know, the lady from REI was talking about how they even go to the level of, you know, when the store employees say things like, you know, our lights are using too much energy. How can we fix that? You know, I mean, they they were they've been on the forefront of this movement. Uh, REI was created in the 30s or late 20s, I believe, early 30s, and they have been. I mean, you know, really building on that sort of take care of the world viewpoint from the beginning. But they're constantly learning, and a lot of the things that these companies are doing are not only improving sustainability at you know the shelf level that you and I see. You know, with the greener products or the recycled soles on your shoes, but also to go so far as to improving the water supply in the countries that they're working in, you know, or uh, using less of uh, less energy in their factories, which actually in the long run ends up being a much larger impact. And it's a it's a pretty intimidatingly wonderful movement. Um, I had this great conversation with the CEO of Keen, which is the shoe company. You know, Keen was uh, originally the concept of a sandal with a protected soul and he said you know let's un-f america man <laughs> and i thought that was that was a pretty cool thought and he also talked a lot about how some of the more sustainable products you know they have bags there that are made completely out of um materials found in uh, landfill in china and he said what did it cost me to make this bag nothing and how, six margin. And how successful is this movement Oh, it's, I, I would say it's global at this point. It is It is wildly successful for the reason that uh, Mr. Gauthier told, talked about in the interview, which is uh, CEOs are finally starting to realize it. going green doesn't just give you an advantage in the eyes of your consumer who see that you're doing something good. It actually gives you an operating advantage because it's so much less expensive to operate cleanly. It, you know, it can be expensive to implement, but as he said in that interview, a lot of times these initiatives pay back within the first year. And, I mean, that is an unbelievable return on investment. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's well, really staggering. My parents have told me about uh, grocery stores, uh, at least some of them in New Jersey, that they use, that they give you two cents off every, uh, for every bag that you bring in. They give you two cents off your grocery bill. Yeah, and so so do some supermarkets where you buy their um, that recyclable bag. It's a, right. this type of bag that Holly's talking about, made out of recyclable materials, and you pay 99 cents or something for this bag. But then every time you use it for your groceries, they take two to five cents or something off of your yeah, bill. That's a good way so to you'll end up getting your 99 cents back well, people, and a dozen times you shop. But people can also be doing this on their own. I remember my, when my father used to tell me to turn the lights off and not use or reroute your trips. You know, doing that does save time and does save fuel, does save energy. If you're going to three stores, plan out your trip ahead of time. Go to each store so you make the less amount of trips and use, and use less fuel. That's part of doing it. It's what businesses are starting to do now. They're starting to reroute their deliveries, reroute their, their operating, trying to get people a carpool, use mass transit, and it is working. Absolutely. And you know what I'll, you know what I'll do for you, Holly? I'll talk to the uh, director of programming over at BaseNet. Oh, wait, I am. Oh, and um, I'll get that uh, interview with Nathan from Harvard reposted on uh, the BaseNet website and on... Uh, YouTube and everything, and even on Facebook and whatnot, and I'll get it reposted so that our listeners uh, could find it a little more easier. That is amazing. That's awesome. And you know, it's I uh, I just I had such a such a great experience this weekend. And as Fred said, you know, you can you can make those cognizant choices. You know, I discovered a brand this weekend called Pat. And uh, not only are they using organic fibers and uh, environmentally friendly things to make really soft T-shirts. Now, what, you know, we, what is that? We couldn't understand it because of your, uh, your little sore throat. And I want to give them the plug. Pat, P-A-T? P-A-C-T. Um, you can follow them on Twitter at WearPact. Um, and that's uh, W-E-A-R-P-A-C-T. 
um, pact, you know, as if though I made a pact with you or I'm making an impact, right. uh, impact, excuse me. <clears throat> and, uh, and I was fortunate enough to meet their, their founder and I, you know, these are great t-shirts, soft material. Um, you know, they cover all the important parts. I know that's important nowadays, ladies, they're a little bit longer, so you don't find yourself flashing when you sit in your jeans, things like that. But Holly, what was that me. website? Uh, you can follow them on Twitter at WearPact, and their and their website is actually WearPact.com. W E A R P A C T. Okay. Yeah. So they're and that you know, but I mean, it's like little things like that. You can choose environmentally friendly brands when you're buying clothing, and it really takes very little research. You know, with the internet, with Google, you know, as a consumer, you can become more educated and you can empower companies that are doing the right thing. And on top of that, I mean, let's be honest, as a consumer, we can make those little changes and, you know, actually decrease our impact on the environment. That's what we need to do. Yes, very, very, I think everybody agrees that in this day and age, or they say, I think the, the research now shows about 99% of people agree all over the world that we need to uh, become more responsible for our planet. Yeah, I just found a little story I thought was cute, and it has nothing to do with anything we're talking about, but it's entitled Gramp, Gramps Wander Off GPS Shoes. And I thought it was, it, I read this and I thought it was great that you know families worried about, uh, about loved ones with Alzheimer's are getting disoriented and wandering off can now get them walking shoes that have built-in GPS devices. Now that's, that's a great, great idea. It's the comp the company A T A T R E X A uh, it's spelled A E T R E X GPS shoes with a tracking system and they'll heal. Go on sale this month. It'll cost about three hundred dollars. I think that's great. I think we and should get them as an advertiser and we'll talk about them every week. I think that is I a great idea. That, Great idea, but I I knew I, I thought that'd be that'd be something that be something that we had to mention because I mean, that, that that's a great little idea. Well, Fred, great, myself, case. myself, and you and myself had this friend, the you know his family friends, um, where if you remember her father before he passed was in that situation. Yes, it was. And remember the time she was telling us the story how he just walked out of the house one day, and. Actually, it happened more than once, and the cops just kept knocking on their door and saying, "Up, oh, we found your father again on the other side of town." Yep. So, um, luckily, the cops happened to just run across him. But well, the cops also knew him. Yeah, these GPS shoes would be awesome. But I mean, especially if you can track him on your uh, on your computer, or you know, find oh he's over here, and then you can send somebody out to go get him. Well, that's a yeah, fabulous that's the, idea. That's the most important part: is you can get to them. You know, you can get to them to be there to take care of them. You can find where they are. Um, you know, that that's the part that's cool. Sure is. No, that, that's a great little story, uh, Fred. Holly, uh, before we move on to any other stories here, uh, reason main reason we brought on Larry the Lobster today, even though he gave us that good little story about the uh, Miami police officer, is we would like to have our first little installment. Uh, <laughs> we're going to bring back... A version of our old show, Holly and the Lobster. We've renamed it Holly and the Lobster Tales. And every week or every couple of weeks, Larry is going to bring us, as Normie used to say, a little known fact. So Larry um, and Holly, here's your Holly and the Lobster Tales and uh, take it. Well, you probably can't consider this a little known fact. It's more unusual than, you know, being a little known fact. It's just I just came upon a story about a cyclops shark, you know, with one eye, you know. And as you know, most sharks have two eyes. Is it a true cyclops? It's a true cyclops. There are pictures not like, of it. Not like a flounder with the eyes oh, on yeah, the side of the head. Oh, oh yeah, actual... no, there are uh, there are photos of it online. He's got an eye right in the center of his head. The poor little thing. I mean, he's almost cute. He just looks pitiful. <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, what they did is, for some reason, um, you know, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not very big. I mean, you know, you can hold it in one hand. Does, does the whole shark? Yeah, yeah, he's a little guy. Oh. I mean, you just feel sorry for him. It's not enough that he only has one eye. He's not even big enough to protect himself. Oh, my God, yeah. And he hardly has any teeth, either. He's definitely a, uh, he's definitely a, um... 
some sort of mutation. And he's not out in the wild anymore, I would assume? He's now in an aquarium or something? Well, I'm not 100% sure he lived through being caught. They caught him in, uh, I think it was, hold on, let me go to the news story real quick. Um, what was the name of the bay? It was caught, and he's an albino shark also, so he's all white. All white. Yeah, yeah he was caught off of uh, off the shore of California, in the Gulf of California. And he was actually a fe- he was a fetus inside of a big mother shark, so they think he might not have survived outside of the womb because he didn't have any teeth and he only had one eye. Sure, well, very interesting. So we need a jingle for our uh, for our little segment here, uh, Holly and the Lobster Tales. So when we come out of our little segment, uh, we can play a jingle. So if anybody's good at writing jingles, please send us a jingle for Holly and the Lobster Tales. Yes, it's all comments to base now. <laughs> and uh, yes, and. Um, Go ahead and send us any of your comments uh, regarding this show in general to info at basenetintermedia.com. And while we're at it, you could follow us on Facebook at Basenet or on Twitter at Basenet TV. And actually on Twitter, we want to thank all of our new Twitter followers. We have been averaging another four or five a day new followers on Twitter. Okay, Holly, something about Apple and... uh, well, this is just a quick one, just to tell you guys what a sad state of affairs we're in. Uh, the uh, New York Daily News has reported that Apple has more money than the U.S. government, uh, that they are holding on to about $81.5 billion in cash. And um, and uh, basically, the Apple CEO responded by saying, uh, t- new chief executive Tim Cook said, the money is not burning a hole in his pocket, and he's not going to do silly things with it. <laughs> yeah, not until they, not until they tax it. Just going to sit well, on it. Well, you know what I, you know what I think. How about lending it to the U.S. government? Well, exactly. You know, they said they said, uh, you know, we have more money than the government. We're not going to do silly stuff with it like the government does. <laughs> there you go. They're going to they know how to spend their money. Yeah, much much more efficiently, I would say. All right. So, do we have anything else here in wrapping things up? Oh, I'm going to wrap it up with a, with a little story about a dog that is in New Jersey now. It's a stray beagle that survived, believe it or not, the gas chamber. It's a stray beagle mix that cheated death in the gas chamber of an Alabama uh, of, uh, of an Alabama dog pound is up for adoption in New Jersey. Apparently, they uh, they began looking for they 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 put this dog in a in a uh, gas chamber the size of the back end of a pickup truck, and the dog survived. So they give they give you a new lease, flying to New Jersey for adoption. So Aww. I thought that was a cute story. Very good. Beats well how we normally end the show. So I guess that's about it. We have anything else, guys? Fred? Not me. Harry? Holly? Nope. Nothing here. here. All right. So from just outside of Boston, Massachusetts, I'm Ed Jupin. In the Pocono Mountains, Pennsylvania, I'm Fred Boas. For about St. Louis, this is Holly Hurley. And from Brookline, I'm the Lobster. All right. We'll see you next time. Good night.